as we turn now to this time, I would just like to share that today I honor my friend, um, Herb Getz, Reverend Dr. Herb Getz, passed away from COVID-19 in December, and I wear his stole today. He served our nation for 30 years in the United States military as a chaplain, and then the church for another 30 years after retirement. In addition, I received word early this morning that Dr. Paul Minus uh, passed away. As you may know, Dr. Minus um, and his family gave the resurrection window to First Church in honor of his daughter. So we lift them today as we turn to this time of prayer and preaching. Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of each one of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our salvation. Amen. It is a miracle that she was even alive. Now she is on her journey back to love. Jesus saved her from certain death, and now as Mary Magdalene makes her way through the dark city streets, headed for the tomb of her friend and her savior, memories of him flood her mind. The way my life was headed, she's thinking, could have been me in that tomb instead of him. It should have been, it could have been, she ponders as she replays her life story, turned around by Jesus. Jesus had loved Mary back to life as he ministered to her and healed her of torment and mental anguish and emotional trauma. It is a miracle that Mary is still standing and moving. Thanks to Jesus, she didn't die young. He cleansed her heart and cleared her mind and made her eternally grateful, and she is on her way to the tomb. As she turns the final corner to enter the garden tomb, her heart is filled with sadness, sadness and deep appreciation that are all mixed together for all that Jesus meant to her. Then she sees it. The huge stone covering the entrance to the tomb is gone. Panic sets in as she pivots and runs back to tell Peter and the other disciples. Once they hear the stunning news, they take off. She follows them. They arrive first to discover the missing body and the linens that are lying there, similar to the linen that we have draped on the cross this morning. Strangely, by the time Mary gets back to the tomb, the disciples have headed home. We don't know why. Alone in the garden, again, she steps into the tomb and she sees two angels. Two angels, by the way, that the disciples did not see. Weeping, she repeats to the angels what she has said to the disciples with one word change. This time, instead of calling Jesus the Lord, she calls him my Lord and she says, they have taken my Lord and I do not know where they have laid him. Apparently, he hasn't gone far. He's right there. He speaks to her, and she doesn't know him by sight. Not until he hears, she, he says her name, Mary, and she recognizes his voice. That kindness, that respect, that love, Mary. She hears him before she sees him. This is real. This is resurrection. Rabboni, teacher, she cries. Jesus Christ, the one who loves Mary back to life and the one who always loved the world and embraced the world in spite of all the evil and discord, the craziness and disdain, the hatred and the inhumanity. He lived in love died in love, and now is fully risen as the Lord of love. And Mary is the first to meet love rising. This story gets better with age. Like a good wine, its vintage improves each year. Perhaps this is true because we need love rising more now than ever before. 
Love rising is a real thing. It's not some sort of metaphor for a preacher to throw out in a sermon on Easter Sunday. Love rising is real. If you don't believe me, ask Father Richard Rohr. And I'm going to share this with you because he has given all of us a mind-blowing insight into the love of Christ rising this morning. Father Rohr is a Franciscan priest who is a gifted spiritual writer and teacher. In a piece he authored this week entitled, Once We Were Stardust and What We Will Be is a Good Surprise, he wrote of our real and cosmic connections to resurrection. Father Rohr points out something that most preachers on resurrection are drawn to Paul's words in 1 Corinthians 15. He says, if Christ has not been raised, our preaching is in vain and your believing is useless. But Father Rohr points out, they always start the verse at the end. They have to go to the beginning. And there in the beginning of that same verse, you will find this. If there is no resurrection of the dead, Christ himself cannot have been raised. Isn't that extraordinary? Think about this. The universal principle comes first. Then, and only then, is it illustrated and guaranteed in the risen Christ. So Jesus Christ is the universal example and the promise representing the resurrection of all creation. Let me say this again so we don't miss the point. Resurrection from the dead precedes Jesus' rising and Easter glory. It has been with us since the beginning of time. The mystery of resurrection is first an all constant and universal pattern, which is then made dramatic, daring, and trustful in the personal body of Jesus. Thank God for science, which is helping us to think this way. For example, did you know that science is teaching us that the same number of atoms in the universe that were there five seconds after the Big Bang happened approximately 13.8 billion years ago are still with us? They just keep playing musical chairs, and by all evidence, at an even higher level of complexity and consciousness. Father Rohr writes, it is not poetry to say that we were all stardust and what we are is yet to be. It is a good surprise. It is a gift. It is the pure grace of God. It is no longer, it no longer seems like a huge act of faith in a one-time miracle that no one can prove, it is right, always, already, now, breaking through all kinds of suffering and tragedy and pain. And he continues, I have seen it in my lifetime and the lifetimes of my family and friends in a thousand different forms, admittedly often shrouded by grief and sadness, and that is why we need an example like Jesus Christ rising, to lead us and help us across the tragic gap that human existence is always in. Right there. Science keeps teaching us. Nothing is the same forever. 98% of our body's atoms are replaced every year. Geologists with good evidence over millennia can prove that no landscape is permanent, Water, fog, steam, and ice, they all come from the same thing at different stages and different temperatures. In the funeral mass of the Catholic Church, the preface says this, life is not ended, it is merely changed. Science is now giving us helpful language for what we've rightly intuited and imagined in our faith all along. Essentially, we are blessed with language that pre predates science, but is supported by science. Apparently, God could not wait for modern science to give history hope. People just needed to believe that Jesus was raised from the dead so that the hope and possibility of resurrection could be planted in our deepest unconscious. Jesus' first eternal life, his necessary death, and his resurrection into the ongoing Christ life is actually the archetypal model 
for the entire pattern of creation from beginning of time till now. He is the microcosm of the whole cosmos. He is the map of the journey. If you need one, look to Jesus, follow the map. Our Christian narrative tells us that reality's true story from the very beginning has always been incarnation. That God's hiding place and the place of God's epiphany in the world is physical. Resurrection is therefore not only a one-time anomaly in the body of Jesus, rather that Jesus is the pattern revealing the pattern everywhere that God has created in the cosmos. Now, Easter is not only one day. Easter is apparently every day and everywhere and always. Thanks be to God for Richard Rohr for revealing this mystery of resurrection and for all the scientists who have helped him out. He has shown us all how Easter is every day and love is brought to life in the resurrection of Jesus since the Big Bang Theory. And I'm not just talking about the, the Big Bang Theory, that's a good show, but I'm talking about the Big Bang itself. We are cosmic stardust in the mind and heart of God. Now, for those who are not as cosmic as all of you, let me bring this back to 444 East Broad Street in Columbus, Ohio as I close. The incarnation that we know, we know together. Maybe I'm just speaking for myself, but I know I need resurrection to be real more than ever before. I need love rising in my life right now. How about you? I believe we need to know that love wins over hate and defeats death. That we need to know that our Savior saves us when our backs are against the wall. I need to know that love conquers death and destruction. And that the little deaths that tear at our hearts and our lives, one paper cut at a time, and the big death itself looms over us and mocks us, but Jesus mocks death and says, go away, leave them alone, let them live. We need to feel the heartbeat of love. We need to taste the victory of love. We need to hear our name spoken in such a loving way that our hearts delight the same way Mary's did when she heard her name spoken by the risen Savior. There have been too many days in the past year that I have been in this sanctuary alone. And here I've wondered how you were, where you were. I've sat here alone and I've looked at the pews, empty week by week, the hymnals that haven't been opened for 55 Sundays, the Bibles that haven't been opened for 55 Sundays. No notes have been written in the pew pads and how I miss the cartoons that are in there by the kids. Your hugs, your smiles, your laughter, your singing, your love, all missing here. Like Mary, I have come to the empty tomb and found the stone rolled away, and I've wondered, where have you taken my congregation? Where are my friends? Where is my church family? Last evening, I came down here and I sat alone in the sanctuary to be with God and to pray for you. Well, I started actually in Parish Hall. I sat on the stage, I looked out, and I could see you laughing and enjoying one another, with the children darting here and there. And I could hear Tom and Nancy and Marty on the piano as we joined in singing morning prayer. And I could see the tables full of children and morning treats, and I remembered the days when some of us wish we hadn't brought chocolate for those morning treats. And I could, see, I could see the kids, and I remember carrying them back from the nursery back to, this, back to Parish Hall, and some of them are too big to carry anymore, but I still carried them. And I saw the little ones serving communion and offering the body of Christ and the blood of Christ to the adults in bread and grape juice while taking a few extra pieces every time they would move between adults. 
because it's really good, the saving grace of God, in bread at least. And I was filled with joy. Then I walked into the sanctuary. The sun was setting to the west. As I took a seat in the southeast corner of the sanctuary, in my mind's eye, I saw you all here. I sat next to you. I held your hands. I hugged you. I heard your voices. I saw your smiles. I kissed the babies. You know, I always kiss the babies. I blew kisses to the little ones. And I held you in my hands and in my heart. And then I gave Leslie a hug, and Larry and Diane were coming in the west side door, and I waved to them, and I exchanged handshakes and greetings with Tom Kuhn. And then I welcomed John Bachman as he waited to talk about the final four and who he was sure would win this year. And then I waved to Emma Dean, and I reached out and touched Twink Star's arm as I went down the center aisle, proceeding to the chancel. And then I passed the peace of Christ with you, and I sat beside you in the pew as we listened to one more glorious postlude by Kevin, and the room filled with amens. You were all here at sunset last night. We were all together again. There were even new people who, you won't believe it, but they found us on YouTube. Remember YouTube and Facebook and Zoom. As Saturday night's last sunburst came through the stained glass windows to the west, the window with the single candle was lit up like fire. And I heard Jesus say this, Tim, everything will be all right. All their lights are shining tonight. They are aglow with my light. Tim, believe the good news. I'm shining in all the members of this church. I'm shining on them and through them to others. And with that, the window darkened and twilight peace descended in the sanctuary. As twilight gave way to darkness, one thing stood out in the darkness. It was the white linen cloth hanging from the cross. And then my eye caught the white flowing movement through the new creation banner. My brothers and sisters in Christ, we are a resurrection people. We are rising with Christ's love. We are designed to rise. We've been created from the, from the moment that the universe started to be love in this world, to be love in this universe, just as Jesus Christ has shown us in his rising to love. And so I offer you my final words on our journey back to love. These words were my first words in the journey on Ash Wednesday. I said on February 17th, I implore you to take this journey of the heart. Figure out the things that you are carrying on the journey back to love. Look closely at the things that weigh you down and bring out the worst in you. Name them, claim their existence, and then let go of them because they weigh you down and they bring out the worst in you. Hang on to the things that you carry, which are beautiful and healing and hopeful, and keep your eyes wide open. Keep your hearts wide open. Keep all your senses wide open as you step ahead. And finally, be grateful for everyone who cares about you heart and soul. Jesus Christ is risen today. Alleluia. Amen.